Hi everyone. Thanks to Pure Sport CBD for sponsoring this week's episode. Pure Sport CBD are the world's most trusted and certified CBD brand. Pure Sport CBD was founded by two professional athletes. These professional athletes could not find a CBD brand that could guarantee them passing a drugs test. Upon realising how effective CBD can be for dealing with recovery, sleep, pain, inflammation and mental well-being, the two athletes decided to start their own CBD brand and Pure Sport was born. I have been using these products myself for a while now and absolutely love them. In particular, I use it for back pain and anxiety and it's had a positive impact on both of those areas. If you'd like to try some for yourself, please use the code QS15 for 15% off products on their website. The website is www.puresportcbd.com and you can find them on Instagram at puresportcbd. Hi everybody, welcome to uh, another episode of Shaky Sports Journeys. Um, I had an episode in rugby previously and I've gone back into a sport that I'm very familiar with, which is cricket. Um, and today I am joined by an uh, ex-South African cricketer um, and also very, very renowned franchise cricketer from all around the world. I'm talking Caribbean Premier League, I'm talking the IPL, the PSL, the Vitality Blast. I'm joined today by uh, David Bisa. How are you, my friend? I said, how are you doing? You well? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm good. You're currently How's the, in weather? My... How's the weather holding out there for you guys? Eh? Certainly a bit colder than where you are. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I, you know, don't, don't, don't rub it, don't rub it, don't rub it in too much. <laughs> so, just, just for the listeners, David is currently uh, sitting in uh, Karachi, Pakistan, um, yeah. and is taking part in the PSL. And is just actually his team is just actually my my my, my home city, my fatherland. Um, as a place for the Lahore Calanders, and they've just made the final of the PSL. So we will touch on that later on today, but exciting, exciting times ahead. Um, David, what I want to do is I'm going to take you back. You were born on the 18th of May, 1985, Rudyport. Yeah, it's Transvaal a suburb province. of Johannesburg. It's a suburb of Johannesburg, yeah. Okay. Tell me about what it was like growing up there. Well, actually, I was born there, but we didn't stay there for too long. So, you know, long story short, my dad works or worked for Anglo-American, which is, uh, he was in the coal division there. He was in the finance you know, accountant for Anglo-American. So we moved around quite a bit when I was younger. Um, you know, we used to go from mining city to mining city. He'd go, you know, he'll go to a mine, do the finance over there, be there for 18 months or so, and then move on to the next place and next place. And so, you know, my childhood was, you know, moved around quite a bit from small mining village to mining village. And then eventually, you know, when I was, uh, what was it, about 10 years old, I think, uh, we moved to a, a place called Whitbank, which was now a big city life for us, in, you know, in terms of where, you know, where we came from before yeah. that. So, you know, that was exciting. Then I spent most of my school in Whitbank also and, you know, grew up there. So, yeah, I was born in, in Littleford, but moved around quite a bit and then, you know, eventually settled in a place called Whitbank. Okay. So cricketing wise... During all the, the the moving around, had cricket really started? Was it cricket from childhood? Was it was it something that you know? I know South Africans love their cricket, love their rugby. Was that something that was you know a part of your family background? Yeah, um, it always was in a sense of you know South Africans they just love being outdoors and playing sports and everything. And I, I have an older brother that's three years older than me, so we used to you know compete in everything. We played tennis, we played cricket golf like 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 everything but you know cricket for me was always something that was you know first love for me since since the days when i used to watch john t lord's hansi on tv you know it's something that i always enjoyed and you know just playing in the back garden the whole time that's where it started and you know it was sometimes it was tough you know coming from the small cities opportunities you know opportunities weren't always there but you know it was always just something that i enjoyed playing and just enjoyed doing and you know it was just always my first love with the 92 World Cup, I had quite a lot of influence. I know you come from a similar similar age group to me. Um, obviously, it was a broken, well, it's always broken hearts for South Africa, unfortunately, to say in a World <laughs> Cup, even though they've been tipped to win it so many times. Um, I thought that was a bit unfair on them in that 92 World Cup, but really that was, uh, 
that was a launch for me, especially for me. And you know, Pakistan won it, so it was exciting yeah. times. But in my opinion, one of the greatest World Cups of all time. Yeah, I think you know, '92 was harsh, and then obviously the other one for us was uh, was it the '99 one that, that we that we don't really want to talk about. I think I was a little bit older then. Uh, you know, you could understand the emotions a bit more at that yeah. stage. Um, the '92, you were you were a kid, so you're just disappointed that you know what happened, but you didn't quite understand the emotions around it. So you know, the '99 was a tough pull to swallow. But yeah, you know, from from '92, I think South Africa showed that you know coming back into international cricket there. And, you know, then we started competing and started playing against the you know, big tours coming up. And, you know, that was also a big catalyst for, you know, the younger generation of us coming through. Absolutely. I mean, in my opinion, in the 99 World Cup, South Africa were were uh, the strongest strongest squad. Um, I mean, they were unbelievable. They were they were strolling that semi-final um, yeah. against uh, Australia. Obviously, there was a moment of Herschel dropping the, drop, oh, caught, catching it, stroke dropping yeah. it. Um, and then Donald not oh, just broke broken hearted. <laughs> I, I was I was I was broken hearted for you, and it's happened a few times. Can you explain the curse? What is you know what what why can't why can't South Africa get over the line in these semi finals? Yeah, you know, lots to be spoken about it, and you know, there's that dreaded C word that that everybody uses, and um, I I don't think it's it's gone that far because for me, you know, if you choke in a game, you in a winning position, and then you kind of just throw it away from there, and mm -hmm. I don't. I think we've ever been in such a strong winning position. Maybe that, you know, 99 was the, the exception where we got so close in a winning position. But, you know, I don't know if there's just that expectation now going into, uh, you know, into a World Cup. You know, South African people are, you know, the fans are passionate and they're a cloud nation. And, you know, our rugby team's done really well, won a couple of World Cups, you know, and our cricket team's always done well, just hasn't quite gotten over the line in the World Cup. So I don't know if it's now just a little monkey on the back that, you know, starts itching a little bit when you get to those tight situations and then, you you know, you tighten up. But, yeah, I feel our time will come. Um, we, we're putting together a nice young squad now. Uh, we've got some good management, good people in, in top level now that's, that's taking care of the game. So, you know, hopefully come 2023 is the next 50 over World Cup. You know, you never know fingers, what happens. But Fingers yeah, crossed. If Pakistan, if Pakistan don't win it, unfortunately Scotland are not at it, but if Pakistan don't win it, my fingers are always crossed for the South Africans. Um, so it sounds like, you know, it sounds like a good, good childhood. Or elder brothers, you must obviously you got up to playing lots of sports. So, you know, good, good memories. Um, when did you break? When did when did you start breaking into like getting into serious cricket teams? I mean, you obviously went on to play for the Titans, um, but what was your kind of junior rep stuff like when you made your name? Yeah, so again, my way that I went was a little bit of the long way because you know coming from the countryside as we call it, you know, in the the smaller cities, we played. I played provincial, you know, representative cricket from under ten all the way through to under eighteen. But mm -hmm. it was for the smaller provinces. So I played for Pumalanga, um, which is one of the smaller ones. And, you know, it's a small pool of players there. Um, where even though, you know, we have some talented players that have come through from Pumalanga that's represented South Africa and, you know, played for the Titans, um, the talent pool isn't that big. So, you know, you always play the representative of cricket, but the big shock comes when you actually finish school and you go to university. You know, then you see there's a massive talent pool there. You know, a lot of private schools there, a lot of quality players in there. That's when you realize that, you know, maybe you, you weren't as good as what you thought you were. So, you know, I, I went through my whole school career playing, I played representative tennis, squash, cricket, hockey. Um, but again, like I said, it's a small, you know, small place. So there's only so many players that need to fill up a team. Mm -hmm. um, so then, yeah, so I, yeah, I did all that representative, but then went to university and kind of got the big shock when I got there. Okay, so... You play a lot of uni. Did, did you play cricket at uni then? Yeah, so again, that was a weird one because I I went to university, um, went to University of Pretoria, Tuckies, and, you know, went to the net practice over there and introduced myself to the coach and said, hi, coach, um, I'm David Lisa. Um, I come from this place and I play provincials and, you know, I'm studying at the university now. I'd like to join the team. So it's like, okay, cool, thanks. Um, the third and the fourth team is practicing over there, so you can just go slot in there. So I was like... Okay, that's a bit of a slap in the face, but you know, thank you very much. And I'll just go carry on to university. So then I went back to my hometown again because they just got first class status and started training over there with the guys and, and you know, played one or two warm up games. And then I'll never forget the coach came to me and he announced a squad for the first game and I wasn't in the squad. And I was like, coach, what's going on? He's like, uh, listen, we, we just don't feel you're ever going to be good enough uh, to play first class cricket. Um, we don't think you're talented enough. We don't think you're good enough. So we're rather going to focus on other guys who we think are potential. So thank you very much. So they're like, okay, well, that's the second slap in the face for me yeah. right there. Yeah. And then I decided, screw it. I'm just going to go and study. I was studying accounting then and I 
went about six months without playing cricket. And then my old, you know, thankfully for me, my old um, provincial coach then got a job at the semi-provincial level at a team called Easton's, uh, mm-hmm. which is like the feeder system for Titans. And he just came to me and said, listen, I'm coaching you now. You know, I'm putting, you know, I want you to come train with the guys and you know, play a bit of club, club cricket and just come back and enjoy the game again. And, you know, at that stage, he was a good mate of mine and there was a bunch of mates that were playing together. So then I kind of went back and just sort of fun playing with a bunch of mates and you know, having a good time, going one or two away tours, you know, just, you know, with kids who are 19, 20 years old and just having fun. And that's just how it kickstarted again. And then from there, just snowballed and, you know, from Easterns got into the Titans winter squad. And then, you know, from there went training, training, and then eventually, you know, got my chance with Easton. So, yeah, I I think I only made my Easterns for de- uh, my, my debut for the Titans when I was, I think, 22 years old, 22, 23 years old. So, it took me a while to get there. Obviously, also focused a bit on my studies and, you know, graduated first and then went and started playing for the Titans. So it, it took me a long time to get there, but I eventually got there. Did you ever phone that coach back up and say, how you doing, mate? Um, <laughs> I'm David Bisa. You know, I've played a bit of cricket now since then. You remember you, the guy that told me that I, I couldn't make it. It's amazing, though. You know, coaches can be really kind of sometimes cruel. I mean, that could have ended your... That could have, if that phone call didn't come from your, from your other coach, you know, you might have been sitting in a, oh, it might not have been too shabby, sitting in an accountancy farm and doing your thing and making lots of money. But I think what you've went on to do is a little bit a little bit more exciting. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. You you try to look at your career and you, you see what the defining moments are there. And, you know, you, you sometimes think it's the big moments, but it's actually not. It's those small little moments that, that you actually don't think of all the time. But, you know, things could have turned out so differently for me if that coach hadn't got in that position and, you know, I hadn't gone and played there. I would have, like I said, just probably been a, sitting as a chartered accountant somewhere and old and fat and, you know, just working in an office the whole time. So, yeah, I've always said to make it in this career, you, you need to have a bit of luck. And, you know, that's where my luck came in at that stage. Probably that's, uh, you know, everyone has a story and you wouldn't have, uh, you know, it could have gone, out, could have gone either way. And I'm, I'm, ha- I'm happy. I'm happy it did go the other way because, you know, I've, I've watched plenty of you play cricket. Um, you're a, you're a, you're a hard hitting all rounder, good long levers on you. You're six, six foot four in, in stature. Yeah. And you bowl, uh, you, you know, you bowl, you bowl, you bowl good, good heat, smart bowler. You you figured out how to bowl really well. I think in T Twenty cricket, you know, you know your game. Um, so you know, look, it, it's 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 great, it's great what you've got on to got on to do. That then got you, you know, not only did your was the coach wrong about you playing first class cricket, but then you got the uh, the opportunity, you know, down the line. You know, you obviously played for the Titans for many years and you were successful. Mm-hmm. But come the 19th of August 2015, you got the opportunity to represent your country in the first ODI against New Zealand. What a proud moment for you and your family. Yeah, definitely. I think um, that, that's that got to probably be my top moment in, in my career, definitely. Um, I made my T20 debut the uh, winter before that in Sri Lanka, but that was in a, a once-off away tour. And, you know, when that was, that was nice, but, you know, when I got the call up to play the ODIs, everything just seemed to align. The my debut was at Supersport Park, which was my home field, you know, all my career. So my family was there, my wife was there, you know, all my friends were there. And I, you know, I'll never forget. I was even getting little gooses at the moment, just thinking about it. You know, standing there, um, you know, singing the national anthems, looking up, and I looked up straight at my family, and everyone was there. And it was, you know, it was just that that moment when you, you kind of realize you know what all the hard work and sacrifice and everything that you know everything that you've been through you get to share that special moment with everyone that's important in your life you know regardless what happens now you know you, you've always got that moment so you know for me my number one whatever's played IPL played World Cups played all of that you know that's always going to be my number one moment yeah I mean it's uh, uh, to do it in your home ground I mean that's the stuff dream, that's the stuff dreams are made of a yeah. um, couple of steps to walk up there um, I've played, I've, I've had the pleasure of playing at Supersport Park and, uh, you know, those stairs are steep. So if you're, uh, you know, it's a long walk back to, it's a long walk up to the pavilion when you, if you snick off first ball coming down those steps and going all the way back up. But the atmosphere, yeah. it's got a real cauldron atmosphere. Mm. I can imagine it was, uh, it was, ro- it, was it, it was a great, great noise in the stadium that day. And, you know, your family and you'll look back in it forever, I'd imagine. How did you do in yeah. that game? Uh, we won the game. It was against New Zealand. I I think I got a quick fire, 17 or f- I think six or seven balls, something like that at the end. I just placed one or two overs. And then I think I took two free in the game also. So 
steady debut. Didn't set the world on fire. Yeah. I'm not going to lie to you. I did drop a catch and slip of Dale Stane's bowling with the second ball of the innings, uh, which wasn't my how, finest how moment. Did, how did that? How did that uh, go down? Can I imagine? No. Is he, was, was he all right about it? Yeah, he was chilled. He, he's a fiery guy, but he... he Direct said all to the batsman. He each came to me and said, you know, unlucky mate, you know, next one you'll get. So, yeah, that wasn't my finest moment. But besides for that, it was, I'm quite happy with my debut. No, good stuff. Good stuff. You know, I could talk to you about going into talking about your your your, your uh, international career loads, but this, I mean, I really want to, I wanted to concentrate on a few other areas as well, where I think you've you've really played a lot more, which has been franchise. But, but I think it's you know watching you play. I would have expected that you played a lot more cricket for South Africa, and this is um, this is something that I I've seen too much, you know, through the years that a lot of good South African cricketers slip through the net. And why, why, why does this, why does this keep happening? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not sure. I mean, there's, I think because there's so many players in South Africa, you know, it's it's quite. It's quite a brutal environment. I mean, you have one or two bad series, and then you know, if you're one of the fringe players, you out there and someone else is taking your spot also. And, you know, in, in terms of there was that big you know, influx of count, um, Colpac players in, I think it was 2016, 2017, around about there, there was a lot of guys that signed Colpac. I mean, I was one included. And, you know, I don't know what other people's factors were. You know, I, I had my own reasons and, you know, I, I made that decision with my family. And, you know, so I can only comment on that. But there, there does seem to be a lot of, even now, you know, a lot of South Africans, younger guys who's got British passports that go over to the UK, play there. There's one or two playing in the you know, Netherlands. Um, I think there's one or two in Ireland also. So there does seem to be a lot of younger players now that, that are leaving South Africa to go play somewhere else. And I'm not actually quite sure what the reason is for that. If I'm being honest, I noticed a lot of South African cricketers from a white background have made the journey over to over from South Africa. Is that, you know, I've... I've this is not this is not um, something I'm speaking. This is public knowledge that you know there's there's a system in place about a certain amount of players that have to be picked from a coloured background. Um, now I'm all for everything being fair, but I think it should be fair across the board. If you're good enough to play for your country, you should play for your country. It doesn't matter what colour you are, what religion you come from. Is is do you think that's got something to do with the fact that the oper- it's, it's a bit it's a bit harder. To, to make your way in, whereas if you come over to the UK, it's probably a lot more opportunity. I think that is the main thing. I mean, you know, you've got to put it down to opportunity. I mean, just, just straight off the bat, there's 17 counties and only six franchises in South Africa. Of those six franchises, there is a um, transformation target that each franchise has to hit. So there's only a certain amount of spaces available for certain players of whatever ethnicity you are. Um, so, you know, a lot of, you, you can argue that a lot of the guys are leaving because they just don't, the numbers just don't add up for them. I mean, 17 mm-hmm. counties versus six franchises, it's, it's a lot tougher to get in here. And mm-hmm. they might feel, you know, let's make the move young. And then I'm still, you know, four or five years time, I can, you know, qualify as a local and, and play there and, you know, still make a career out of it. Um, I mean, it is always a sensitive topic to talk about, you know, the transformation in South Africa and the, the quota system that they have in place. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, at, at the end of the day, Day. It's something that's always been there. I've grown up with it. Um, mm-hmm. I've, I made a decision from a young age is that, you know, you can either sit back and, you know, tiptoe around it or you can just, you know, accept the fact that it's there mm-hmm. and, you know, um, just make sure you're one of the best in what you do. And, you know, if, you, if you're better than everybody else, then they can't leave out no matter what your color is. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and I think we've been lucky also by the Titans where we've always had coaches who has, you know, being head on with it and, you know, they address the elephants and say, listen, this is what we've got. This is the system we have to work with and let's all just be mature about it. And, you know, sometimes you're going to be disappointed. Sometimes you're going to get left out, but that's just the nature of the game. You give back to the team and then you just carry on. And I think that's always done well for us where at the Titans to be successful, where maybe some other franchises have had a little bit more animosity towards the actual system. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And I'm not trying to, to probe you to to say something you shouldn't that's certainly not but it's it's always been a topic i mean yeah. i actually had on not so long ago omar henry um uh, you know legend of, of south yeah. african cricket um and he was talking about the time of coming through when colored players were obviously not allowed to to yeah. represent south africa so there's you know every there's been there's, there's been a lot of i think issues um behind the scenes and i and i really hope 
that South Africa cricket, you know, and sport in general can get it right because it, clearly the talent that comes out of that country is mm. is phenomenal. Um, and it might be a thing to maybe add a few more franchises if the numbers are a little bit too much, but that's obviously for the the governing bodies to decide. So you make the you make the big plunge. You you had the chat with the family and you, and you decided to to head over to lovely Hove um, and, uh, and 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 the nice. Uh, Nice beach, beach site, beach tight location down there, um, and uh, Brighton, Brighton, Brighton Beach yeah. to play for uh, Sussex County as a coal pack. Please, can you explain yeah. again just how the coal pack system works? Yeah, so the coal pack was basically uh, there was a handball player say named someone I think it's Marcus Colpack or something. Mm-hmm. He went to court to prove the fact that the EU's got a free trade with the uk so if you a uk a eu citizen you can go work in the uk as a local person you don't need work permits well that you know technical stuff i'm not quite sure but he basically exploited the loophole that there's a free trade between the eu and the uk for people to go work there and because south africa was part of that trade um, treaty or whatever also us uh, i think i should Australia, Barbados, it's basically the Commonwealth countries mm-hmm. that were part of it. You mm-hmm. know, we could exploit that loophole also, that as long as the um, UK was part of the EU, we get this free trade and we get to apply our trade in the UK as a local player. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, now with Brexit happening, that is they shut that door so we mm-hmm. can no longer do it. But, you know, that's that's basically the advantages of, of having callback players in your team. You can imagine is that you can only have one or two overseas players in your team. Mm-hmm. But you can get as many coal packs as you want in your mm-hmm. team um, that play as local. So, you know, you can essentially have three or four overseas players in your team if yeah. you sign the coal packs. And that's what was attractive for the counties at some stage. So how was, I mean, great county. Lots of good players have come through the system there at, at Sussex. Um, how did you settle with, uh, with, I mean, who went over there? I believe you've got, is it a young, do- is it a young daughter you've got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She so actually hasn't been there yet. She's only nine months daughter? old now, yeah. So yeah, you, so, you can tell yeah, so, yeah. yeah um, so I went over 2016 Sussex and just played a couple of T20s as an overseas player and did well for them. And then obviously the coal pack contract came through. And, you know, at that stage, I was, I was playing still T20s for South Africa, but I was in and out of the ODIs. Guys like Dwayne Pretorius and Andila Pacquiao was, was coming through and, you know, I just I just felt that that door was shut for me, and when the callback opportunity came along, you know, I thought, well, you know, why not? Let me give it a go. Mm-hmm. And the three year deal came along, and I went there in 2017. Uh, my daughter was only born this year, so it was just me and my wife that went over there for the six months, and mm-hmm. I had an absolute shock. I had probably the worst season of my life in 2017 really? when I went over there. I'm pretty sure if there was a clause in my contract that they could tear it up, they would have attended that season. Because things just didn't work out for me. You know, sometimes you you go into a season and, you know, my whole life I always just played for the Titans. So I felt comfortable there and, you know, I knew the guys, everything. And then I went into this new environment where I thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a call pack player now. I'm an overseas player. I need to perform. These guys have signed, given me a three-year contract and I just went down that rabbit hole of trying too hard and, you know, just... I basically just lost the plot for a while there and you know, I had a bad start of the season. Things just got worse and you start trying to change things technically and think, you know, to be successful in England, you've got to change your game and you know, that just didn't work. Mm-hmm. You know, so by the end of that 2017, I was like, what have I got myself into over here? Mm-hmm. Um, it was really a tough time there for me. You know, that was probably the toughest season in my career. And actually, I'm, I'm thankful for it because, you know, that season just made me appreciate the good times again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then... Luckily, 2018, uh, Jason Gillespie took over. So we had a new coach. It was a fresh start. And, you know, um, things just started to click a bit better then. And mm-hmm. you know, I just, just started getting used to things. And, and I actually just chilled out a little bit more and, and just started enjoying the game again. And then, you know, fortunate for me, the fortunes turned a bit for Sussex. But not, I didn't shower myself in glory in that first season. I'm not going to lie to you. So, you know, you, you showed a lot of character because coming back for that second season, I'm sure the uh, there was a little bit of eyes on you that you know that you, you you need to you need to come good. I mean, a second bad season wouldn't have uh, yeah. wouldn't have, and, and then it puts you under even more pressure. Um, you know, so you showed a lot of character there to come back and and to bounce back from that. I've heard a lot of positive yeah. things about Jason Gillespie. He's obviously he's obviously a great man manager. Yeah, he, he is good. He is really good. I mean, he's played the game, so he knows how to get the best out of a player. 
you know, and, and leading into that that season before the first game, he just came to me and said, "Listen, you've played for South Africa. You know your game. You're one of my gun players. Just go out and you know, I'll back you. Just go out and enjoy yourself." And you know, <laughs> luckily for me, again, the first game of the season, I got a hundred and a five or a four for in that game, and you know, that just settled the nerves a little bit. And it's almost like, okay, coach, you see, I'm not as bad as my last season. You know, I can actually play a bit, okay. and you know, that just settled me down a bit. And then he just came to me and said, "Listen, I told you, you know, it's only a matter of time." So. You know, and since then we we've got a very good relationship. I, I get on well with him, and you know, chat to him quite a bit. And you know, so it's just those small things that coaches do, not necessarily you know technically or anything, just you know getting you in a better mental space. I think that's where Jason's good because he's played the game for so long. He he knows exactly how to get the best out of his players. Hi everyone, thanks to Pure Sport CBD for sponsoring this week's episode. Pure Sport CBD are the world's most trusted and certified CBD brand. Pure Sport CBD was founded by two professional athletes. These professional athletes could not find a CBD brand that could guarantee them passing a drugs test. Upon realising how effective CBD can be for dealing with recovery, sleep, pain, inflammation and mental well-being, the two athletes decided to start their own CBD brand and Pure Sport was born. I have been using these products myself for a while now and absolutely love them. In particular, I use it for back pain and anxiety and it's had a positive impact on both of those areas. If you'd like to try some for yourself, please use the code QS15 for 15% off products on their website. The website is www.puresportcbd.com. And you can find them on Instagram at Pure Sport CBD. Brilliant, brilliant, to, brilliant to hear. Um, you played a third season. You've just, you've just obviously been, you've been over. I watched a bit of you. You're playing with a an ex Scottish teammate of mine, Callum McLeod, mm. who was uh, was down at, down at Sussex this season. And I watched watched a couple of games where you struck the ball beautifully in the Vitality Blast. You know, is that is 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 that your time? Is that is that 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 time done now with with Sussex? Is there any other opportunities that will come to you? Um. So, the, with the coal pack finishing, um, my my contract is finished with Sussex. Um, they I went over there for the T Twenty Blast, and they told me that they obviously with with the coronavirus, it's been tough with the contracts, and there's been a lot of layoffs, and everything, and um, so Travis Head is still going to be the overseas next year because they just deferred his contract another season. And Stian van Sale, who's the other Colpec player, he had a year left on his contract, so they were just going to honour that contract. So they were open with me straight away and said, you know, we'd love to have you back, but unfortunately this is the case. And, you know, so come out and play the T20s, have one good time, you know, one last one song with the guys, whatever, and, you know, come back and play. And, and that was fine for me because, you know, I knew where I stood, there was no pressure or anything, and I played. And I had a good time and I enjoyed myself. And then as the season went on and I did well for them, you know, they started talking about, you know, maybe we need to get him back. Maybe we need to get him back. So, you know, long story short, Luke Light, captain of Sussex, fought my corner hard there to get me back. And, you know, and, and I've just signed now for next year's T20 Blast with Sussex. So I'm not doing the whole season, but I'm at least going to be back for the T20s. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice, nice. That's great to hear. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. I thought that was, yeah. was maybe the end of that, but that's, that's great to hear. Yeah, it was announced, I think, a day or two ago. Okay, um, they, okay. they put it in the media. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, that just kind of settles the nerves a bit, knowing that, you know, I've still got a job, you know. It's, yeah, it's, no, it's absolutely. Such a tough absolutely. Time. So, yeah, yeah, and I enjoyed myself down in Hove. I really love it over there. The people are awesome. And they've looked after us nicely the past couple of seasons. So, you know, I'm glad to be back there again. No, good to hear. Good to hear. So, moving on, obviously, franchise cricket. You're very experienced in franchise cricket. You've, um, you've experienced... All the major leagues um, sounds like a baseball thing, but you have you've experienced all the major leagues <laughs> yeah. around, around the world. IPL, for instance, you you played for the uh, Royal Challengers Bangalore. Yeah, now, we all know how big the IPL is. I'm sure your bank balance is a little bit better as well from the old from the <laughs> from the old IPL. Yeah. Um, how is that? How is that experience? You know, to play play on that stage. Yeah, that was, again, amazing for me, you know, just being part of, you know, RCB, the names that were there, I mean, I was in the changing with Gail and Cole 
Lee and Villiers and you know, Mitchell Stark was there, uh, Dinesh Kartik was there. You know, it was just a team of superstars and then you sitting there like, you know, what's going on? And as things had it, I, I didn't have the best to start with RCB either because I actually planned my wedding on the first uh, the day of our first game. So I had to fly back and miss the first game for my wedding and then fly out the next day to, was, to get back the, for the game. How was the coach about that? Was he, was he understanding? Yeah, the, the coach was Daniel Vittori then and he's he's such a chilled out guy. So, you know, he was like, right, just, you know, go, it's it's your wedding. We can't, you know, just get there, happy wife, happy life. So, you know, had I you, literally... I was, you had booked a wedding not knowing that you were going to be playing an IPL game that day? Yeah, you? yeah. So I, we booked that wedding eight months before I got picked up in the IPL yeah, so okay. I, I had no idea that I was even going to get played because that was the first season I got picked up in the IPL mm -hmm. and as soon as as soon as soon I got picked up and those fixtures came out I was like okay so who am I going to annoy you? am I going to annoy my wife or am I going to annoy my new you made the right decision mate you made the right decision yeah. definitely made the right decision so yeah, that was a bit of a lucky start. I mean, I, I was there in India for 10 days and flew back, landed the night before my wedding, got married and then we flew out again the next day and had our honeymoon in India uh, for the next six weeks, which was also awesome. But, you know, just, just to play in the IPL, it, it is something you can't explain to anyone. The, mm -hmm. you know, the, the fans, the atmosphere, you know, the noise that goes on there, the hype around the tournament, you know, it, it's, it's just unbelievable. And, you know, they're so passionate over there. Um, it's, it's just such an awesome experience and you know to be part of a team like RCB I learned so much playing with those guys and you know the coaching staff and everything it's, it's, it was just unbelievable unbelievable experience for me Brilliant is there, is there is there a chance of playing playing IPL IPL again? Hey, look I, I chuck my name in the auction every single year mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's one of those that it's not something that I've, I set my heart on you know um, I had two years of IPL I enjoyed my time it was awesome you know I really loved it and you know the two years I was there RCB did quite well we lost in the semi-finals the first year and we lost in the finals the second year so you know I was part of a successful team while I was there so you know I would love to go play again I've always said you know I just I'd love that one more stint in in the IPL just to you know just to sign off but if it doesn't happen you know I'm, I'm content with the IPL career that I've had I had two good years we did well as a team and you know, um, I enjoyed myself. So it's I chuck my name in the auction every single year, but it's not something I get my hopes up on. I actually don't even follow the auction when it comes up. It's because it's not something I'm expecting anymore. If it happens, it happens. And yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it'll just be a bonus if it happens at the end of the day. It's something that I get my hopes up for. Caribbean Premier League, um, another tournament that you have uh, you've played in, and um, that was for Trin Trinidad, I believe. Uh, Barbados. I actually um, did two stints. Um, I did my first my first stint for Guyana. I just went in as a replacement player mm -hmm. uh, for two weeks, and then the second stint was with Barbados, um, where we did the entire tournament. But that was also a bit of a uh, RCB connection because the owners of RCB was the owners of Barbados also, so they got right. me and AB to go play there for Barbados also for the season, which was quite cool. Yeah. How how was that? How was the experience over there in the Caribbean? Yeah, that that's also amazing. Uh, like. You know, you being in the Caribbean and us being in Barbados, first of all, you, you're living, you based on an island paradise. It's, uh, that's the awesome side of it. And again, my yeah. wife went with me. So, you know, she loved that also. Um, it's actually a tough tournament. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, the, the traveling is difficult. You, you think, I'll never forget, I think we were playing in St. Lucia and then I had to go to St. Kitts. And we're sitting on the runway in the plane and I could literally see St. Kitts Island over there. But it took us like six hours to get there because it's like a bus service. You fly from this island to that island, pick people up, go to the next island. And then St. Kitts is only the third stop away. And then you eventually only get there. So the, the traveling was was a bit of a nightmare. But the tournament is awesome. You know, the West Indies have got some great players. And in their conditions there, they, you know, they dominate the tournament. And again, there was a, a big learning curve for me. It also didn't go to play in that tournament. Um, but again, it was a big learning curve for me. And I enjoyed my time there. You know, it's interesting to hear. You're very honest. You're very honest in your your assessment of of all, all cricket, all all tournaments, etc. You played even your your first class, your young days, everything. You're very very honest about it. Um, sport is not all about the highs, is it? You 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 got to take the peaks and the troughs, and it's how you you know. It's a lot of mental yeah. mental challenges where you you spend a lot of time. I'd imagine alone in a hotel room. How yeah. do you how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the challenges of that? I think I had to learn the hard way also when I was a bit younger, I was a bit of a hot head and, you know, always trying too hard. And, you know, the biggest lesson that I learned is, um, you know, a coach came to me the one day and he was quite instrumental in me playing for South Africa also just with the mindset of things. 
Mm-hmm. Um, he's coaching Otago now in New Zealand. And he just said to me, listen, you know, at the end of the day, cricket is a game. It's that that's all it is. You mm-hmm. win, you lose, and that's it. If you go out and you score a hundred today, your wife's not gonna love you anymore. If you go and get a duck tonight, your wife's not gonna kick you out the house, she's not gonna love you any less. It's just the game. Don't let the performance on the field influence the person that you are off the field. People mm-hmm. are still gonna love you if you're a good person off the field, regardless of of what you do on the field. And that was a bit of an eye opener for me because you know it's always like you score and you feel good about yourself, and then you mm-hmm. think, you know, everybody else feels good about you. And you know, and it was just that mental switch of saying, you know what, it, it, actually, it's not the end of the world. I mean, you know, the sun comes up in the morning and at the end of the day, sport is a competition. And on any given day, someone has to win, someone has to lose. And, you know, it's, it's literally not the end of the world. And, you know, that, that was the big mind switch that, that I made there. And, you know, I was 30 years old already when I, when I did that mind switch. So, you know, it took me a while to learn. Um, but since then, I, you know, you learn to put a lot of things in perspective. And, you know, th- and that is why I can actually reflect honestly and say, you know what, I wasn't my best in that tournament. And yeah, I did do well in this tournament because it's it's all just numbers at the end of the day. It doesn't reflect on who I am as a character. It's just your performance is your numbers at the end of the day. Great insight. Great, great to hear. Um, great words from the, the coach that gave you those words. You know, yeah. they're, they're really powerful. Um, just, you know, it is a game. Um, and we do beat ourselves up a little bit too much over it. And you sound like you, you, you know, through the years you've evolved and, and you seem very relaxed now and in a, in a good headspace, which leads us into, uh, you're sitting in a, in a lovely, lovely Pakistan at the moment. Um, you've had a good tournament so far and your team has made the final. However, your team, who, by the way, I'll be supporting the Horka <laughs> Linders, are taking on your old team, the Karachi Kings. Big, big fixture that one. Uh, what you know? What's the what's the mood like in camp? Yeah, I, I think it's um, okay. Well, just let's let's just go. You know, get one thing. You know, let me just be honest again that I don't really see Kalachi as my team because yes, they did pick me up at my first PSL thing, but I only played one game for them, so right, okay. you know, I didn't really contribute that much towards the team. Where when I came to the Calendars, I've played nearly all of the games I've been here and you know you just feel a bit more part of the team in in that aspect so you know so um yeah so playing against Kalachi obviously you know that is a massive city city of a city lovely in Pakistan and and the mood over here you can just feel social media building up a little bit you know everyone's talking about it you know there's a bit of media coverage going on that you know it's it's the dream final of the PSL it's what everyone's been waiting for Um, and even for the Hawks I mean um, you know, traditionally, Lahore's had a tough time in this tournament. We finished last in all of the editions. I think the previous three or four editions, we finished last. Mm-hmm. And now suddenly things have clicked for us and, and we've made the final. And, you know, we've always been seen as like the whipping boys of the PSL. And now suddenly we, you know, we're in the final. So there's a bit of expectations from the side of the year. And, you know, I think the boys will be a little bit nervous come tomorrow, but hopefully they just get out there and enjoy the occasion and, you know, it's not every day you get to play in a final, so you know you just have you go and enjoy the fixture and enjoy the occasion. But you know the, there is a lot of buzz going out at the moment. It's, it's just a pity that you know, it's going to be behind you know closed doors with with you know the COVID at this stage. Um, but you can still just feel the energy in the city. Yeah, that, I mean that would have been something else if the if the crowds were allowed in to watch watch a final yeah. like that. It would have been unbelievable atmosphere. I mean, yeah. I've experienced yeah. the packed house watching a game in Pakistan from many 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 years ago um and i mean they're they're just it would probably be very similar to the ipl you know where the crowd would just yeah, be definitely know, they're, 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 it's infectious the energy mm. what's um tell me about your experience of pakistan um i I, t- I talked to you briefly um but when you were before you were just about to head out there and you had said you know only positive things but tell tell me a bit more about it oh i I always enjoyed coming to Pakistan. Um, it's a little bit intimidating when you first get here, mm-hmm. just purely because there's the massive security issue that's been chucked in your face. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you get off the plane and they escort you through VIP style and you get onto a bulletproof van and there's just you know, cops and guns. And, you know, you think to yourself, you know, what's going on here? There's helicopters yeah. flying above. Um, but that's just purely because you know, everything that's happened in Pakistan, yep. they can't afford to have anything else go wrong. It's it's mm-hmm. not because they're expecting anything. It's just, you know, if, if something goes, you know, touch wood, if something goes wrong now, there's never going to be any cricket again yep. in Pakistan. And that's and that'll be such a shame for this nation that, you know, loves cricket so much. Mm-hmm. Um, so once you get past that that phase, like for me now, getting into those vans and, you know, going to the field, it's just, it's just another day. It's just another trip. You don't even pay attention to, you know, the, the armored vehicle 
vehicles, guns and all of that stuff. Um, and then also, you know, they sell hospital. Yeah. They understand that we can't just sit in a hotel the whole time. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we've got off days, they organize us to go play golf. They organize us to get out. We've been to the movies here before, you know, we go walk around the, the mall and everything. Um, it's just, it's like everyday life. It's just the only difference is when we go somewhere, we just need to notify the security that we're going to go there and then they escort us there and, and that's it. Um, so I've, I, I love my time in Pakistan. They, you know, the people here are amazing. They, they're so passionate about the game and they'll, they'll, they look after you so nicely. Yeah, they'll do anything for you. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just a pity that there is that stigma that it's an unsafe kind of stage because, you know, my experience is that it really isn't. Yeah, I mean, it's, you echo what a, a lot of players have said in the media that have mm. have made the trip over there. Obviously, Darren Sammy um, is a bit. He spent a lot of time over in Pakistan. I had him on a few months back, and he's like, uh, I mean, he's practically be, practically been given citizenship mm. in Pakistan. Yeah. Um, so you know, and he talks about, and you, you, I can see what you're saying. You know, you arrive somewhere and all that security and everything, you mm. put you a little bit on edge, like you know. But when you had the issue that happened with the Sri Lankan cricket team. Yeah. They can't, like you say, take any risks. But I think it's probably some some players I've heard say it's probably the safest place. I mean, nobody's going to mess yeah. with you with all those guys around you. I mean, they, you're 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 bullet you're you're bulletproof basically. You know, there's no there's no risk factors. And you sound like you know it sounds great to hear that you are actually getting to go and walk around the malls and experience some of the country. Because I think a few years ago when players went over, they weren't allowed to even leave the hotel, which is pretty depressing. Yeah, they, they uh, the first year I was here, uh, we just came for the playoffs and then it was just in the hotel or whatever. Um, but, you know, since then it, it's eased off a little bit and you know, us being playing for Lahore and being based in Lahore, they, they looked after us really nicely. We went to go play golf there. Um, we went to, there was some function at um, some politician's house or something that we went to and it was a nice little, you know, function they put on there. We met all the dignitaries and everything. Um yeah, you know, we've we've been they, there's a lot of functions now that you go out of the hotel. It's not anymore in the hotel, um, which is which is nice. I mean, it's it's not great being stuck in a hotel, even though the hotels are awesome. Yeah, let me let me say that also. You know, the the hotel we stay in in Lahore's got five quality five star international restaurants, so it's not like you get wow. there and you, you know, it, it's really it's 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 nice. You you don't you know you don't feel like you're getting cabin fever or anything. They set up mm -hmm. a nice game room for you. You know, the gym facilities are good. It's just like if you didn't know you're in Pakistan, it would just be like any other place that you that yeah, you go yeah. to. Um, so yeah, and, and it's nice that that they they do let us get out and go play a bit of golf and you know just get out a little bit because they understand that that you know you guys can't just get you know stuck in a hotel the whole time. But yeah, they look after us really nicely. Yeah. Well, by the time this episode comes out, the the PSL final will have will have taken place. Um, it's going to be out very soon. But um, you know. My, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm happy to put this on record. I'm a Lahore, ma Lahore man, so I'll be, I'll be rooting for you and team. What do you think of your chances? You're up against, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying here, you know, but Babar Azam plays for, uh, plays for Karachi. You're up against probably one of the best batsmen in world cricket at the moment. Have you got some? Have you got some tricks up your sleeve? How, how have you got any? I mean, I know you can't say anything on record just now because uh, you've, but you've got, you're going to be bowling at one of the best players in the world. How, how are you preparing for that? Yeah, look, actually, they've got a quality team. I mean, they've, the Baba Azam's the captain, but, you know, they've got Alex Hales playing for them. Um, Chris Jordan was playing for them. They've got like guys like Chadwick, Chadwick Walton and Shepang Ladderford playing there. Um, you know, Wayne Ponal's playing for them now. And also their local players, they've got uh, Mohamed Amir, um, Imad Wazim, they played for Knots in the Blast. Yeah, they've got a really good, really good team. You know, they've got a really good team. So it's, it's going to be quite a contest. Um, yeah, in terms of, you know, we... We played them twice in the group stages. We beat them once. They beat us once. Um, so it's, it's going to be a good battle. Um, hopefully, again, they, they've never won it before. We've never won it before. So it's, there's going to be a new champion crown either way. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just going to, at the end of the day, whoever does the basics on the day, the best is going to win. But you know, in terms of you know, bowling to those guys and the plans, we'll, we'll, we'll sit down and, and you know, analyse. You know, they, they've got so much footage of players nowadays. You, you sit down, you analyse, you try and put together game plans and, mm -hmm. you know, give yourself the best chance to, to win the game and, you know, to be better than the opposition. But again, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's just whoever handles, you know, T20 cricket, the shorter the game, 
the bigger impact one player can have. You know, one guy can just have a blind on the day and, you know, he turns the game around and he wins it single-handedly. Um, and that's the exciting part about T20 is that no matter how much planning and preparation you do, there's always that possibility that someone's going to have a blind and, you know, just win the game by themselves. Um, so hopefully that, that guy's on our team tomorrow. Um, but e either way, it's going to be an awesome game. Well, when this gets posted, hopefully I'll be writing congratulations uh, to Dara Visa um, and Lahore, Lahore Kalanders as well, because, you know, um, this, as I said, they'll be up. But I just, I wanted to pick your brains and your mindset. You're about to play in a big final. It was really, really interesting to hear. You know, you seem very upbeat, very relaxed about everything and you're ready, re you, you and team sound ready to do your thing. So fingers crossed we'll be celebrating a Lahore Kalanders win very, very, very soon. Um, to kind of finish with, you know, and coming to the back end of this now, you, you show a lot of dedication as a cricketer. You spend a lot of time away from your family, your friends, and all these different things. Uh, you know, how do you, how, how do you deal with that? You know, I, I speak to a lot of different sportsmen from a different, different walks of life, and they, you know, it's, 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 it's challenging, especially when you're a, a type of player that you are, that you're franchising, you're traveling all around. You know, how did, how do, how do you and your family, how do you manage those kind of things? Yeah, I think it is it is a unique situation to find yourself in. And, and it's one that I think that what helps me a lot is the fact that I've been doing it for so long now. So you know, straight off the school, I left home and I went to university and I never went back home, basically. Um, so I've been used to spending long time away from my parents. So, you know, you almost develop that relationship of, you know, just having a, a phone call you know, every second, third day, checking in, seeing, you know, so it, it it's going to sound heartless, but you don't almost miss people because you so used to that type of lifestyle where mm -hmm. you know your connection to the world becomes a mobile phone and you know as long as you're just chatting to people and everything you know then, then you still feel part of their lives mm -hmm. then i've been doing that for so long that that you know that just becomes second nature um and then obviously getting married my wife's got her own business so you know we thought that she's quite flexible i mean mm -hmm. she gets to travel with me whenever she can you know she's mm -hmm. she's been with me the whole time in the uk she's been with me twice to the IPL. She went with me to the CPL. She went with me to Dubai um, oh. when the T10 and everything was there. So she, you know, we enjoy traveling and we, we almost make a spectacle of it, you know, after the tournament, we'll stay behind a little bit longer. We'll, you know, we'll tour a little bit where we are and see the world. And, you know, and that's been another, you know, fortunate thing that cricket's given me is that I've seen a lot of the world and, you know, I'm thankful for that side of it. Um, but, you know, now having a daughter at home, she's now nine months old and, mm -hmm. you know, she hasn't been able to travel with us yet. And, you know, that's been where I've, you know, I've really started missing home just because, yeah. you know, your daughter's there and, and you see her and, and FaceTime does help out. I mean, I can't imagine what guys did 10, 15 years ago when there wasn't video chat, when there wasn't, you know, face to face talking over the phone. You know, that must have been so tough and it probably would have changed the way I see you going away also. Mm -hmm. um, but at, at this stage, you know, first time does help out. Video chats does help out. But it does get tough after a while, um, being away from home. I was now seven weeks in the UK by myself, you know, without family, without my wife, daughter, anyone there. And it does get tough. Um, but you also, you've just got to remember that, you know, it's a privilege to do what you do and it, it doesn't last forever. And there, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of guys that would, you know, cut off their arm to be in your position type of thing, you know. So you can't take that for granted. And, you know, if I've got to put in the, you know, the tough spells of two months or so by myself to you know for my family to you know do what i love doing and to you know for set my family up for the future you know your career is only so long so you know you've got to you've got to take the good the bad um but it's definitely a lot more good than bad at the end of the day um but it's it's all a mindset and it's just something that it's part and parcel with the job and unfortunately you do miss out on a lot of occasions i've missed out a lot of mates weddings birthdays yeah. um yeah you know, i have missed out on that but it's just, it's part of life and, you know, I'll catch up on it at some stage when I get to settle down and, you know, I suppose I have to get an office job and get old and fat and all of that nonsense. But, you know, until then, it's just the lifestyle I've chosen. It's the lifestyle I love doing and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah. And a big shout out to the to the other halves out there and the, the wives and the kids that, you know, support people like yourself. I mean, you know, it's, it's it, you know, it shows shows how strong the love is and the, and the support is because there's a lot of, wives and uh, children that go without, you know, the likes of these big test cricketers and, you know, the, it's not so busy these days, but some of the schedules in years years past, some of the amount of time the cricketers will spend away from home and any sports people, you know, it's a, there's a it's a, it's a, it's a real tough time for, for family, friends and everything. So, you know, you're, you're lucky, you're blessed 
to have to have yeah. that support and like you say plenty of time to get fat and old and uh, and then watch your watch your daughter as she as she starts to grow so look it's been it's been fantastic to talk to you i think you've given a, a it's been a really interesting to get into your kind of into your headspace um i normally go through all the highlights of the career and stuff like that and, and I'm, I'm starting to find it's more interesting to hear about you know your journey the ups the downs the mental side of the game and you've been you've been fantastic to listen to so i just want to say thank you very much for your time especially the night before a final um, I feel very privileged. Um, thank you again. No, it's only a pleasure. Thanks for the chat. You've, you've given me time to kill you and just you know take my mind off the game. So that's awesome. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it, man. Cheers. Cheers.